I'm going to play some of this and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these techniques of emo using emotion, using false information and psychology to, to sell war and promote war. Imagine that you're on your way to drop your daughter off at school. Every hundred yards, you pass a checkpoint where because you're Uyghur, the police check your ID, iris scans, monitoring every moment you make. Imagine that once your daughter gets to the school, she's interrogated with questions such as, do your parents pray at home or read the Quran? And imagine her honest answers lend you in a concentration camp the next day. Imagine while you're in a concentration camp, your daughter is taken away and sent to a state-run orphanage. You only find out what's happened to her when you see her face in a government propaganda video bragging about the orphanage system. Does this sound like a science fiction dystopia? Absolutely. Sadly, this is the life of the Uyghurs today in China's controlled East Turkestan, which authorities call Xinjiang meaning new territory or new dominion. I am standing before you as a human rights advocate, attorney, immigrant, and American. But more than any other title, my Uyghur identity is the most important aspect of my life today. Just want to pause it there. Use it. There's so much, like, I'm only literally, like, a minute in, and there's so much there, like he's using, you know, the keyword identity. He's using a lot of buzzwords, right? Identity. He's using concentration camps. Uh, he's weaponizing the identity of Islam. So, he, you know, people think of Islamophobia in the U.S., which, of course, we're 100 <laughs> percent against. But then they say, oh, China's Islamophobic, uh, using the story of his daughter. Uh, and again, this is in front of world leaders, very powerful people who who run the world economy and, and heavily invested in, uh, in, in the weapons manufacturing industry. I'm going to play a little more and I'm going to get some, uh, some comments here from you guys. Uyghurs like me are experiencing cultural genocide in Xi Jinping's China. Just two weeks ago, Xi Jinping told the world that remolding and replacing other civilization is both stupid and destructive ideas. Consider the Holocaust. Throughout the history, Crises of this magnitude have not started overnight or have not happened overnight. They started small, predicated on lies, and expanded rapidly. China has a long history of persecuting Uyghurs. In fact, I was born in a prison camp in Kashgar at the height of cultural revolution. For committing the crime of being a Uyghur, my mother was locked up, beaten, and tortured. She was forced to deliver me while wearing a cast from the chest down. This changed in the late 80s and early 90s. It was a time of relative freedom and economic progress. I remember going to religious services with my father on an important holidays. I witnessed the revival of Uyghur culture. As a child, I felt strongly the sense of relief and joy in being able to participate in community life. But the China of today is not the China of my childhood. China is rapidly regressing back to the worst version of itself. In 2009, China began militarizing social control in the name of combating uh, extremism. The regime is implementing high-tech surveillance and on a vast scale, drastically expanding the imprisonment of Uyghurs and other ethnic uh, Turkic minorities, and exporting these surveillance technologies to other authoritarian regimes from Cambodia to Venezuela. Cities, towns, villages are blanketed with surveillance cameras. Entire population are subject to mandatory DNA and other biometric data collection. Monitoring apps are installed on every phone. Think of East German Stasi police state with cloud computing, artificial intelligence databases, and you will have a pretty good idea of the life of the Uyghurs today. Stuart Edwards said on a, a very great comment, even his use of quote, imagine and quote, consider are dishonest. It's taking the audience from a place of analysis 
to the realm of imagination. He knows what he's doing. Wow, that's a great comment, uh, Stuart. Uh, Eddie, what are your what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, I actually had that written down. <laughs> he said, imagine if, you know, could you only imagine <laughs> if this were real? Could you imagine if a country uh, was such a dystopia that Xi Jinping was making all the decisions himself and running everybody's personal life? Um, like, it, 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 it is impossible to imagine that a country would actually be run like that and the people would never rise up um, against their dystopian leaders. But he also compares it. He says it's literally a sci-fi dystopia. Like this is so bad that you can't even imagine it. You know, it's beyond the realm of reality. It's science fiction, um, <laughs> which is interesting. But uh, they, they, one thing I notice is they always uh, make the Hitler comparisons. You know, mm, it's always, always. Uh, at, at first they were just saying concentration camp, right? But then he takes it a step further and says, you know, the Holocaust started small. Um, they always have to compare it to Hitler. Meanwhile, you know, the the imperialist class, uh, the U.S. ruling class, are the ones funding neo-Nazis all around the globe. You know, um, they they fund Nazis, Hitlerites, like the Azov Battalion, whenever it's convenient for them. Um, and, and one of the, not a Hitler-esque group, but one of the extremist groups who they've uh, um, funded and, and supported uh, both directly and inadvertently through their funding and arming of the Mujahideen is this group called the ETIM, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement. And this is a, an extremist terrorist group, uh, mostly made up of Uyghur Muslims, a very small percentage you know, of the total population of Uyghur Muslims. Um, but they're a violent separatist group. And, you know, when they talk about surveillance going on in the in the Uyghur autonomous zone in, in China, you know, that there have been security crackdowns um, and surveillance, especially in Xinjiang, um, because there were a bunch of terrorist attacks recently where like in Arumki during the Arumki riots, 140 people were killed and there were ETIM people running through the streets with severed heads. Um, and, and this happened after the U.S. took the ETIM off their list of, of terrorist groups, of global terrorist groups, because they want them to um, destabilize China. So in, in doing that, they allowed the ETIM to recruit and gain power, um, leading to these massacres and these riots, which the Chinese government then did something about. So, you know, you can say it's uh, authoritarian or whatever, but yeah, it's them using authority to combat imperialism. Uh, to combat these violent extremist groups killing people um, in what's known as the Uyghur Autonomous Zone, which, I mean, even that name itself kind of debunks some of these lies, doesn't it? The fact that they have a Uyghur Autonomous Zone, like, do we have yeah. an indigenous autonomous zone right. in the U.S.? Like, no, of course not. The government would never do that for um, a minority group in the U.S., but China is actually trying to protect um, the Uyghur culture and, and allow them to develop economically, which is exactly what the U.S. is trying to halt by backing terrorist groups and, and trying to push for more sanctions on uh, Xinjiang. Dude, that's such a good point. And I think it really touches on one of the main techniques that the imperialists use in media manipulation and mind control, which is controlling the frame of abstraction. Even Marx talks about this concept of abstraction Gatlos mentioned something earlier that in dialectical materialism, we understand that societies in constant ebbs and flows, constantly moving, constantly changing. It's like water in a river. And this happens with any conflict, right? There's going to be the first punch in a fight. You know, you see a street fight. Somebody, let's say hypothetically, you're walking down the street and some guy runs up to another guy and just like punches him really hard in the back of the head to steal his phone and the guy gets you know he falls to the ground he drops his phone and now the guy who was just punched you know he's bleeding he's he's bruised up he goes he gets up and manages to beat up the guy who stole his phone and starts fighting back and starts punching him back but at that moment maybe somebody walks up with their phone and captures the guy who was initially robbed and beat up fighting back and so that frame of abstraction that snapshot right it's like a camera it's like you get a little static image of what the conflict is and you base you create these universal ideas based on just this little abstraction 
And that's exactly what they do with China and the Uyghurs, where they'll have these groups like the the uh, East Turkestan Islamic movement, these crazy, crazy people who are not even, I wouldn't even consider them Muslims, they're just extremist imperialist stooges backed by the U.S. trained, carrying out these horrific terrorist attacks, proxies, basically. And the second China defends itself, not doing anything crazy, right, just locking people up, investigating the situation, maybe putting a few more cops out there. They're like, oh, my God, China's cracking. Did you see this? Look, they're they're cracking down the, the genocide. And it's like if if you're going based on just that little abstraction, that little snapshot, you're creating this universal idea about the conflict that is not really accurate. Uh, and I, th I think that's one of the main strategies of, of mind control. What do, you, what do you think about that, Carlos? I really like your example of the fight because it shows that part of the essence of dialectical materialism, it's already ingrained in the sensum communum, in, in the common sense of the people. And we have, you know, a, a we have common sayings to depict this. Don't judge a book by its cover, right? Don't just pass judgment on what you see immediately, but realize there's always more stuff behind that. So I think that's absolutely right. But, um, you know, what's funny is that uh, this guy says he's a humanitarian and an activist and a, a, you know, someone who, who really values human rights. Um, but, uh, you know, he's in favor of the treatment that the U.S. has given Muslim extremism. So I guess, you know, drone strikes and bombs are more humanitarian than some oversight so that the extremist groups like the ETIM that the U.S. The US has funded in the region to fight communism so that those groups don't continue hurting communities like the Uyghur community itself. Right. So but th this is a human rights advocate. Um, but in part, he's right. Right. He's talking about the country that with only four percent of the population has 25 percent of the. Oh, no, that's that's the U.S., that's not China. It's not China, the one with concentration camps locking up a quarter of the world's prisoners. It's the U.S. And it's yeah. doing it disproportionately to black and brown people. So it's, yeah. it's just a joke. It's atrocity propaganda because it makes the people doing this that know they're doing it for profit. They know they're doing it to fight off the enemy that is shifting global markets away from American imperialism. They know they're doing it for profit, but they need a nice little story to feel good at night. And that's where mm. the property atrocity propaganda comes in so that they can feel good and so that they can lie to the masses that are well-intentioned. No one wants concentration camps. No one wants cultural genocide, right? But if you engage with the information as most Americans do, which is just abstractly, most working people are too busy working most of their life and enjoying the little time that they have off watching sports and stuff. They pay too much attention to this and to study it the way that you need to study it in order to see through it. You know, people are well-intentioned. No one wants concentration camps, so people are going to be uh, are going to buy into it, right? But this atrocity propaganda is so important to debunk because it reaches people in the way that we communists should, not just at the level of reason, but at the level of passion, at the level of emotions. And that's really what moves people. You can't have a revolution if people are just rational. There's no emotion. You need emotion in order to have a revolution. And in order to sustain the existing hegemonic order, they also need emotion. They need people to be yeah. tied to the existing order and tied to the enemies the existing order has. Dude, tied, such to a... having, excuse, tied to having as enemies the enemies the existing order has. Sorry. Such a great point. And no, it's it's 100%. Like They, they weaponize that emotion and that's why in all these like pray for ukraine shit and and all this and the Uyghurs, they play like the sad music in the background they'll show kids um i want to just skip to the part at the end where he talks about like you know what we need to do and all that ordered to eastern china and other countries today 18 countries including ecuador pakistan uzbekistan the uae and even germany have already adopted chinese surveillance techniques to repress and or monitor their own citizens. In fact, China has been promoting these methods as a way to deal with world's so-called Muslim problem. About 12 years ago, the Chinese authorities confiscated my parents' passport when my brother married the daughter of a leader who spoke at this forum uh, earlier. I haven't seen my mother since my law school graduation 15 years ago. 
My parents have not met five of their eight grandchildren. Let's get to the part at the end where he, uh, even though Chinese citizens to even know the existence yeah, of go. these camps. This is a problem for those of us in this room and leaders around to solve. If you remain silent, this problem will persist and spread. And if that, that's if we remain if silent, this, this happen, problem will persist and spread. What does that say about us? Many business leaders, scholars, government officials are feigning ignorance today. History won't be kind to those who turn a blind eye. Our silence is aiding the status quo. You no longer can say you did not know because you know now. I don't want you to be just concerned or feel pity for me or my people. I want you to be outraged and I want you to act. Consider partnering with I want you to bomb China. An organization like the Human Rights Foundation. Make your voices heard and speak loudly and tell your country that they need to stop doing business with Xi Jinping's China. Pressure your government officials to stop trading with China and companies like Huawei and Hikvision. Pressure the International Olympic Committee. Demand the Chinese shut down these camps if they still want to host the... They just show Hitler in the background. <laughs> Don't invest in the companies the building facial recognition, racial profiling surveillance system. Pressure your government to adopt the Magnitsky Act. Business as usual cannot continue. The famous words of a clergyman by the name Martin Neumüller in the Nazi Germany have a new resonance today. When I was growing up, I never thought that this could happen. If you don't stand up and fight for your rights, this could happen to you. So crazy stuff. Stuart, again, with an amazing comment. He literally just hypnotized his audience and is closing with the hypnotic command. Seriously, this is wizardry, guys. This is, this is you know, if you want to talk about magicians and uh, and propaganda, this is, that's it right there. Um, I also, you know, I know we're running a little bit short on time um, and I don't want, I know you guys have been up for a, a bit. I, I want to share one other clip with you guys um, that I want to comment on. Um, this is a little bit about, Edward Bernays, uh, somebody who we've talked about before, who is considered to be the father of modern propaganda and imperialism. And he is, in my opinion, one of the highest magicians of imperialism. He understands human psychology very well and how to manipulate people. So I'm going to play some of this and we'll, we'll comment on some of that. No single man can take full credit for the rise of American advertising. Edward Bernays certainly deserves more than most. Known today as the father of public relations, Bernays was responsible for campaigns that changed the lives and minds of the American citizen forever, having a hand in everything from political leaders to smoking culture and what Americans ate for their breakfast. He was a self-proclaimed master of propaganda, and while others thought it a dirty word, Bernays recognized its power and the effective moral benefits it brought to society deeply controversial individual by the way the irony of this video is that the video about this master propagandist magician the music in the background is like how to make cupcakes it's like doo -doo -doo -doo. and it's like he's doing like the most evil shit and it's like this light-hearted music so even that in itself is fucking you know is is, is manipulation bernays himself boasted that nazi propagandist joseph goebbels read his books and used his techniques his methods blurred the lines between effective advertising and outright brainwashing. But to understand American branding and consumer culture today, the impact made by Bernays and his methods and philosophy cannot go unrecognized. Born in 1891 in Vienna, Austria, to American parents, Edward Louis Bernays was the nephew of the great Sigmund Freud. But he didn't stay in Austria long, moving to America when he was young and gaining an education in agriculture. Despite this, he had no passion for the industry and chose journalism as his first career. His first exposure to the powers of spin came in 1912, when he became co-editor of the Medical Review of Reviews. Writing a review for a controversial play, Bernays described it positively as a propaganda play that fought for sex education and began to see how effective such strategies could be. His talents began to shine when he lobbied support for the play and its message from the likes of John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. 
staying in theatre, he began to work as a creative press agent for plays and performers, leaning on controversy and emotive issues to help promote plays. On one occasion, using a sexually suggestive photograph of the star, while in another, promoting a play in line with an orphan charity. Bernays was developing the skills that would soon come to define his career and caught the attention of the Committee on Public Information as the US joined the First World War in 1917. This is where Bernays would find his true calling. It's During where it gets his time interesting too. The CPI, <laughs> Bernays worked to build support for the war in the American population and hmm. would later describe what he did as psychological warfare. In 1919, he used the term propaganda in a press release to describe the function of the CPI, and this uncomfortable word and connotations resulted in the demise of the organization. But the lessons Bernays learned would stay with him. Seeing how effective propaganda could be during wartime, Bernays began to realize the same methods could be used in peace. Psychological warfare, he believed, could be waged on the American population to much benefit to the individual and the organization. And so began his career as a public relations consultant. Bernays incorporated his uncle Sigmund's psychoanalytic theory to help define his early techniques. He recognized that people were motivated by other desires, that the population had a herd mentality, and that their opinion was something that could easily be manipulated. In the 1920s, Bernays was hired by the Beechnut Packing Company to help them improve their sales in bacon. The problem, Bernays quickly realized, wasn't in the product or price, but in the American mindset. At the time, a light breakfast was considered the healthiest way to start the day. Bernays sought to overcome this by approaching around 5,000 physicians and having them sign a statement that a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs was far healthier. <laughs> he had this published nationally, and when the American population read the report, the sales of bacon shot up, and what is today considered the all-American breakfast was born. But yeah. Bernays' mastery wasn't just able to increase sales, he also has a hand in politics. In 1924, he worked with President Calvin Coolidge, altering his stuffy public image and leading him to re-election in what is considered one of the first publicity stunts on an American presidential campaign. He was then approached by Lucky Strikes Cigarettes. They had two problems when they hired Bernays in 1927, both linked to women. Firstly, sales of cigarettes in women were low, not helped by the taboo of women smoking in public. Secondly, their green packaging was considered an unfashionable color. Changing the packaging would have been too expensive. So instead, Bernays convinced fashion designers to include the Lucky Strike's shade of green in that season's designs and held a green ball at a fancy hotel where the most fashionable and famous members of society attended, all dressed in the... By linking bananas to good... Oh, this is the good part right here. And at demonstrations, he hired women to wield their cigarettes and had them photographed and printed in the news. Women across the country followed suit and sales skyrocketed. But arguably, Bernays' most controversial campaign was while working for the United Fruit Company. Hired in the early 1940s, it started innocently enough by linking bananas to good health and helping boost sales. Bernays recognized early the need to promote a positive spin on the growing countries in Central America. That changed when the Guatemalan dictatorship was toppled by a coup d'etat in 1945 and a new democratically appointed president was elected. This should have been seen as a positive change, but the United Fruit Company had long exploited the Guatemalan workers with low wages, agreed under the previous government, and this change saw their profits drop as workers went on strike. Bernays had the revolution portrayed in a communist light in the national media, <clears throat> of which he was the primary supplier of information. In Guatemala, the UFC were linked to the old regime, but in America, Bernays portrayed the UFC as a victim of the communist menace, spreading <clears throat> misinformation and lobbying the US government. This eventually resulted in a further coup in 1954, assisted by the US intelligence agency, and a return to the old ways of oppression for the Guatemalan workers and high profits for the UFC. While he also worked for non-profit organizations and reportedly turned down offers from people and organizations he didn't want to be associated with, such as the Nazi Party, Francisco Franco, and Richard Nixon, amongst others, Bernays was a man who often saw past the moral obstructions of his work. 
The term public relations is preferred as a glossier name for what Bernays did, but the man himself did not shy away from the reality. He believed in propaganda as a power of good and argued that people will be manipulated one way or the other, so it was the duty of a good propagandist to ensure the correct ideals were promoted in society, which he called the engineering of consent. And <clears throat> without it, a democratic society would fall apart. So a lot there, uh, a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, let's start off with you, uh, Comrade Eddie. Uh, your your thoughts on all that? Yeah, interesting. That was um, a good video. I don't know. I hadn't heard that much about uh, Bernays, um, but it's interesting to hear. I mean, the, the the CIA and the intelligence agencies and the imperialists have always had this obsession with mind control, right? Like they are just like the best thing in the world for them would be able to just go into people's minds and make them think whatever they want, but they can't do that. So there's all these efforts to get as close as possible. Um, one of those being MK Ultra, um, where they, you know, dose people with drugs and um, basically tried to wipe out their memories and replace it with whatever they wanted. They found that they couldn't do that, but they could destroy people's minds. Um, so then they trained up all these Latin American dictators like the Argentinian military junta and Augusto Pinochet um, in all these tactics to like destroy people's minds. Um, and then also gave them kill lists and hit lists with all the socialists and, and communists in the region. Um, so they've always, you know, they basically tried to mind control socialism and communism out of Latin America, or at least the southern cone of Latin America, um, unsuccessfully, of course. But um, and, and it's also interesting talking about these mind control techniques. Uh, one of the techniques that the CIA first uh, pulled out during the coup in Guatemala, which the video talks about, um, was the the technique of calling anybody who associated or, or accused the CIA of involvement in this coup, um, the coup which ousted Jacobo Arbenz, um, which we know the CIA was directly responsible for now due to leaked documents. Anybody who said that back then was portrayed as a conspiracy theorist. You know, you're just a whack job with tinfoil on your head. Um, you know, <laughs> believing all these conspiracy theories, same thing you're told today, you know, if say, um, you have skepticism about the, the narrative of Uyghur genocide in China mm. you know, or, or various things like that. You're called a conspiracy theorist. Um, this has been in the CIA mind control playbook for a long time. And it's just to make you feel like, you know, if you have this opinion, no matter how much research you put into it, they're just trying to gaslight you out of it. You know, like, uh, no, you're a conspiracy theorist. If you believe that you're in this crazy fringe minority. Um, and another Another one of their tactics that um, is, I mean, I think their main tactic right now um, is is getting, I, mean, I guess this has always been it, but getting people to spread their BS and their propaganda for them. Um, getting the people to believe this, like with the way that guy ended his speech at the Oslo Forum, the one we just watched where he's like, you need to act, you know, <laughs> yeah. this now that you know. You know, it's weaponizing people's compassion, saying, care about this issue. People are dying. Don't you care about this issue? Now go tell all your friends about it. Um, meanwhile, you know, you're spreading imperialist BS. But um, this this happened. Or, uh, yeah, there was a, a story I kind of want to tell that happened on, on TikTok where there was this congressman who was reaching out to a bunch of the political TikTokers when I had first gotten on the app. Um, and he wanted to talk to us about Xinjiang and he wanted to push for this bill that would have put a whole bunch of sanctions on Xinjiang, China. Um, and, you know, all of these people who I considered to be socialists, you know, they were young people, so I don't blame them, you know, but they, they all fell in line. They're like, oh, the congressman, you know, said that something's going on in Xinjiang. I get to be on his show. Um, and, you know, I got attacked, attacked by people for saying no, you know, like, eventually what I got people to agree to, I'm like, okay, even if you think a genocide is going on, if you want to call it that, okay, how are us sanctions going to help? You know, how yeah. are sanctioning the Uyghur people, um, you know, going to, going to fix this genocide. And actually when, when those TikTok kids went and met with that Congressman, I actually got one of my friends to ask him a more critical question. Um, you know, how are sanctions going to help basically? And the Congressman had nothing. Right. He had absolutely nothing. He was just banking on, um, you know, everyone accepting this idea because he was in a position of authority 
And, and these are kids on TikTok who are just trying to, you know, whose politics are basically their personal profile, um, their online profile, which is another way that young people are tricked into um, supporting imperialist stuff, too. But, yeah, I, I think that's all I got. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I remember when I back in 2013, 2014, and I went to a protest, hands off Syria protest in New York. It was huge. Times Square and hundreds of people on the side of hands off Syria and also hundreds of people on the side of invading Syria and attacking Syria. It was honestly one of the craziest protests I've been to. And I remember when I first got there, one of the strategies that the anti-Assad people did is that they had a poster board like in elementary school, you know, when you do the science project, they had all these pictures of dead babies and bodies. And I look at some of the pictures, I'm like, those are kind of old. Like they don't even look like they were in Syria, you know, like some of the, the kids there, it, it just looked like street kids in Latin America or like African kid. And it was like, Assad is killing babies. Like stop the baby killer. And everything was like linking Assad and babies, Assad and babies. And so what they do a lot of times is like, they'll link a name. It's like, if I started a rumor right now, if I'm like, Yo, Eddie uh, beats up little kid, beats up babies, right? He wrestles babies and he beats them up. And I just start and I say it over and over and I dedicate my whole channel to that. And I'm like, Eddie, baby beater, Eddie, baby beater, Eddie, baby. And you say it like 10, 20, 30 times. And that image is going to just get stuck to you, you know? And that's one of the techniques of slandering as well in mainstream media mind controls, like Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical and it's just like, I see that happen over and over and over again. And it's the same thing with Uyghur, like literally even for myself, like we're programmed when I think the second I hear the word Uyghur, I think genocide, you know, because those are the two words that are so often and these algorithms that they're programming in our minds and on, on the internet. Uh, it's just, it's just crazy. And also, uh, Carlos, what do you think about, you know, all that and uh, Bernays and everything we've just been talking about? Well, I think it's fascinating. And the way to fight it is through this old Socratic dictum, which says, always start through know thyself, know yourself, like start with introspection, with, with reflection, critical reflection, because you're going to see that a lot of the filters through which you structure the world and through which you begin to decide how to pass judgment on things on are these unknown knowns, these things you don't know that you know, but which structure the way you see the world. And that's the subconscious. That's the subconscious. And it has a tremendous influence on conscious life. Yeah, when you pass judgment on things, you're conscious. But there's a whole realm behind that working that's social. And as you said, repetition, repetition, repetition. There's this old Latin proverb, Repetis, repetitio est studiorium, right? Repetition is the mother of all knowledge, right? Except this here is not knowledge. Repetition is, is the mother of ingraining into the subconscious of the people certain ideas that then structure their conscious life. And it is so much worse now with social media. Because before, like, we engage with propaganda, of course, when we read things, when we go out and stuff. But now we have our phone as an extension of our body. Mm. We're constantly on social media. And that's constantly hitting us with propaganda. And, you know, Eddie and I have talked on the channel a few times about the philosopher um, Hans-Georg Moller. He's a professor in China. He does work on what he calls profilicity. He says, look, we've shifted because of the technological revolution into a new way of building identities that's based on the stuff we put on our profiles. And the way that we come to understand how it is that we should think is based on these social validation feedback loops. Basically the reaction that the people on social media give to your shit, right? And when that group that affects these social validation feedback loops, which are called, we call them the general peers, general peers, when those general peers are as easily manipulatable as they are today, that means that effectively the powers that be have control over your process of identifying with yourself. Your process of curating an identity is, is now 
controlled by these propagandists. So propaganda, I, I think today goes even deeper than Bernays is not just passing opinions before when, you know, you were in the mode of authenticity, people can separate who they really were from their opinions. Now they can, right? Now who they are is tied to the stuff they put on social media, to the opinions that they have. And those opinions are directly shaped by these interests, these imperialist interests, which have bots that make some stuff popular and then dig other stuff, shadow ban other stuff, and which allow things like what happened, what happened with Cuba in 2021. Mm. You had a bunch of fake pictures. You had an Egyptian, uh, an, an Egyptian, basically a malecon, a, a place in front of the beach. And they said, oh, my God, look at the Cuban malecon. <laughs> look at how many oh people are there. It was fucking Egypt. And it was five years before. And they did that with a bunch of things. It was a kid that had gotten shot by the Colombian police force. And they said, oh, my God, look at what the, the Cuban police did. The Cuban police doesn't even carry guns. <laughs> they no. got all these fake pictures. They allowed them to be proliferated on social media. Once that happened, they changed the opinion of a lot of people. And then what started as a fake or a bot ended up changing real people's minds. It got popular through bots. And then it influenced people's minds into buying into the propaganda against Cuba. And it happened with Bolivia. 68,000 fake accounts were shown to have been created in order to overthrow the Bolivian government in 2019. And it all goes back to this guy and to the realization that, you know, paradoxically, that we're not just individuals, that we're not just these Robinson Crusoe individuals separated from society, but that society is so ingrained in who we are that you can shape people's consciousness just by having in their environment the constant repetition of something. Uyghur genocide, Uyghur genocide, you're going to believe it, right? So it, it, it's interesting, right? The bourgeoisie continues to have, especially in its ideologues, this idea that you know you have these Robinson Crusoe and 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 you have these individuals completely divorced from the from their environment, but in their ac activity they know very well that that's not true. That's why they they do the things that they do. Um, so I, I think that for us this requires us to understand how deep it is that some of these ideas are ingrained into people. It forces us to understand that we need to be sensible when we talk to people because these are things that especially now if, if you buy into the pro felicity thing they're who people are who they think of themselves as is tied to all of these things that they have come to accept through propaganda so we have to be sensitive when we talk to people and understand that you know when when we just come out very aggressive we're attacking the person themselves by attacking their views sometimes we're attacking them because that's so tied to who they are now but yeah i i think this 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 is something that can only be combated again with the dialectical materialist outlook. There's no way around it. Um, yeah, well, so, and I want to... Yeah. Can I add mm -hmm. something real quick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for sure. You, you're talking about the effect of these bot accounts. Um, and these bot accounts don't even have to necessarily say anything, right? It doesn't have to be bot accounts that are saying the same thing. There are bot accounts like that. Yeah, I hope that siren stops soon. The, the feds are after um, you, man. Right by my house. That was crazy. Um, but they don't have to necessarily say anything. All they have to do is boost a certain kind of content. So you have all these bot accounts who like a certain kind of content and going back to how pro felicity works and how they get people to spread propaganda. You know, if you have certain kinds of content that get tons of likes, you know, say if you're talking about, um, you know, if you're spreading anti-Cuban propaganda during SOS Cuba, all these bot accounts are going to come like your account. Then, because people's profile and their sense of self is tied to this online mm. this online profile, they're going to be encouraged to spread more propaganda like that. Um, and, you know, maybe if they, they could they could have gone towards Marxism, Leninism, and anti-imperialism, but they, they drift um, because of Twitter clout. And it sounds ridiculous, but, it, you know, it's true. We all feel the dopamine rush when someone likes your tweet or whatever. Hell yeah, dude, that's such a great point. And honestly, me personally, that's why I got off of social media. Uh, I'm no longer on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And I just felt like it was, I had an unhealthy relationship with it. And I just decided to, I only have YouTube and that's pretty much it. And that's why I like to keep it because I have, I like to have face-to-face -face interactions or conversations as opposed to uh, DMs or, and 
a hundred percent you people get that dopamine hit once they spread that propaganda so they're combining like spreading you're basically getting rewarded mentally every time you spread imperialist propaganda and it's just really disgusting to see that you and know and uh, mm -hmm. it, it's conscious the, the, one yeah. of the co-developers of facebook said it explicitly we want it to function psychologically as an addiction mm. so it's not like you know this is just a side effect it's just something latent no they're very conscious about what it is that they're doing 